Hi guys, welcome back. This is episode 125 of Match Hat, featuring part two of my interview with the creator of Frayed Knight's Skull of Smackdown, Mr. Jay Barnson, also known as the Rampant Coyote. In this part of the interview, we talk all about computer role-playing games and tabletop role-playing games, the games that influence and uh, continue to inspire Jay, and much, much more. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Jay Barnson. Well, Jay, you know how much I love turn-based uh, combat. Now, you've really? already kind of talked about this a little bit. You say it's sort of like a Bard's Tale, early wizardry. I mean, there must have been some temptation, right, to, to make it real-time combat, like Might and Magic 6 or, or Daggerfall. Now, did you wrestle with that at all, or what do you think are the advantages and disadvantages? Um, you know, there. It, well, I, it was a temptation. I mean, my, my initial plan was for turn-based, but I was using a, an off-the-shelf engine. It's actually the, the Torque game engine. Um, which is now obsolete. They've got a new version out. I was, you know, already committed to using an older version, which with all of its attendant technical problems, as it was designed before Windows 7, before, you know, the iPad, anything like that, <clears throat> you know, it, they pretty much retired it when Windows XP was still king. Um, but anyway, but I, you know, I had this game engine and it is a modified version of the game that or the game engine that was used for tribes if you remember how old tribes is got a copy of it back there somewhere excellent <laughs> um so yes it's uh, you know same same basic engine that's doing that which is of course a real-time engine that really really wants to be a first person shooter i mean they did a lot to make it not so first person shooter ish you know and to say oh this is a generic engine works for anything but so much of it was really wanting to be a first-person shooter. And so that's where I started from. And I said, you know, I, I, I had a thing. I, I had a couple of a little aborted projects that I kind of learned to use it. And I was like, okay, you know, let's, let's make this game. What is the easiest game to make using this, you know, game engine? And of course, the action, you know, the action RPG would have been a lot easier because the game naturally wants to go that way. Part of the problem I keep running into is, you know, some of the, disparities between the turn-based and, and, and the real-time and the event system that it has and, and everything. It's, uh, you know, you have to kind of force it a bit. Um, but from the get-go, I, I decided, hey, I want this to be turn-based. And the reason why was, just like I said before, uh, doing something that the mainstream game studios aren't doing. I mean, that was, that was a, you know, so it was a little bit of marketing hat, but it was also me saying, you know, I, I, I miss those games. I, I, I wish someone would play it. And eventually you get to the point where it's like, well, if no one else is going to do it, I'm going to do it, dang it. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I'm, I'm not the only one. There are some others. The, uh, uh, the Basilisk Games uh, is doing their Esch Echelon series. And uh, we've got uh, uh, Heroic Fantasy Games is doing you know, Knights of the Chalice, which is fantastic. I mean, all these games, these guys are doing some fantastic stuff, many of which didn't exist when I first started with Frayed Knights. So, um, yeah, I, again, took took a long time in development. I don't want to take that long ever again. What do you think is the greatest CRPG ever made? The greatest CRPG? Frayed Knights, duh! <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, that's a, boy, that's a loaded question because anything, anything I say is going to be held against me. Um, Almost I can say as if by design. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'll make it easier for you. So, so what is, what are some uh, CRPGs that inspired you? I know you mentioned a few, Wizardry, Bard's Tale. Yeah. Um, actually, my, I can just go by my favorites and, uh, which look, well, a game that looks very little like Frayed Knights, except maybe in the story uh stuff uh ultima 7 that uh, was that was the game um the black gate yeah the black gate <laughs> i actually never never finished the part two the serpent isle because it had a bug that uh technical support at origin was never able to help me out with uh which would result in me never getting invited to a to a dinner party or something uh in sure that was uh, new magencia <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I I played the game for like a week straight, and they kept telling me, "Oh, wait, sooner or later you'll you know you'll get the invitation." And I did everything I could think to do on the dumb islands, and finally I called up tech support, and I was like, 
how am I supposed to get the invitation? Oh, you just wait. You know, you'll have a, a golem come and deliver it to you. I'm like, it's never happened. I've been here for like a year of game time, <laughs> and it's never happened. And they're like, oh, uh, do you have a 486 from, uh, what was it, Cyrix or whatever? And it was my CPU or something like that. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's a bug. Sorry about that. <laughs> That was it. You know, I'm like, do you have a patch or anything? No, we don't. Um, so yeah, I want to go back and replay it sometime. Uh, Ultima Seven. That was that was a inspiration for me. I mean, all the Ultima games. I mean, if you talk about Ultima Three, was the game that first blew my mind when I was a kid. Uh, I, you know, I'd played a couple of RPGs. I played like, Telengard and this other mail order game from. Was it Aardvark, sorry, something in the back of a compute magazine that I, you know, I played a couple of these and I finally got my hands on Ultima 3 and I played that one and oh my gosh, that one, that one blew my mind. I was like, this was my vision of what a, what an RPG can be. And of course, followed up with Ultima 4, which made Ultima 3 look like Telengard by comparison. I mean, it was just amazing. And in fact, I got uh, uh, what the cloth map from Ultima 5, I've got it hanging on my wall right next to my my chair and so you know when i got really disgusted you know as you know you work in the long hours just trying to fix a stupid bug for three hours and it's like okay i got like five thousands of these i have to work on and this one's taking me all night this game's never going to get done what am i doing why am i wasting my time doing this i'd, I'd look at that that ultima map and that was I'm like that's that's why i'm doing it not that i can really compare my my game to ultima 5 but um those are those are some of the biggest inspirations to me, but I, I did uh, get a lot of inspiration from uh, the Wizard Wizardry Seven. I hadn't played Wizardry Eight until after I'd already begun development, and that was the thing. Is people said, "Oh, your game's just like Wizardry Eight. and I'm like, "It is." I've never actually played it, so I finally played Wizardry Eight, and I thought, "Okay, this, yeah, they're they're right. This is great." Um, so you know, the Wizardry series. Uh, Bard's Tale to a lesser degree and to a much lesser degree Might and Magic. Um, I, I just played a little bit of Might and Magic games, um, you know, when I, when I, when I was younger um, and uh, finally got kind of back into them to, to, to play the later ones and the, the earliest one that I'd missed um, just, uh, just a couple years ago. Went out to you know, put a plug for gog.com i picked them picked up the whole series and been having a having a blast playing them unless you didn't mention diablo or uh, <laughs> i love <Diablo>. Daggerfall. <laughs> i you know i love both of those 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 are those are great games but they weren't the model that i used for for frayed nights so maybe i'm uh i'm letting a, a little bias show you know it's funny because uh you know and the other one that i i think is one of the best and i know some people hate it is uh uh, Baldur's Gate 2 was actually uh, a huge... Some people hate that. <laughs> Some people hate <laughs> it. I don't know why. I, mean, I, I love it. Um, I, I think it's fantastic. And all the, all those in Infinity Engine games, you know, you know Planescape. Uh, uh, and, uh, a terrible game. I, <laughs> <laughs> there's this little, uh, you know, critics hated it, you know. <laughs> but uh, all of those games, I, you know, were, were also fantastic. Um, you know, don't know what happened. I haven't really been getting into the Bioware games right. quite so much lately, but uh, at least those early games. I think it might just be because they were—they're almost like so eclectic. They, they really felt more like you're uh, going in and playing in a pen and paper game with your neighborhood DM. I mean, and you know, yeah, there's the balance was broken, and there was some stupid stuff and some really irritating stuff, but it was just so packed with uh, passion i guess you know all these guys obviously loved what they did and that was uh, that probably made the game uh for me and uh, all those you know those early games that's a lot of it. I, I i mean that's why i really dig the the indie rpgs is that that raw passion that they have in there you know they're not nearly as polished um uh, but there's you can you can see the the you know, kind of the developer behind there, the designers behind it, and uh, yeah, and they're a little more freeform. They're a little worry, less worried about making sure everything just you know lines up nicely and just saying, "What's fun? Let's throw it in there." And uh, anyway, I really love those. What do you think it is about CRPGs that makes them so compelling for guys like us, anyway? <laughs> you know, uh, boy. I think there's there's a there's a whole lot of aspects. I mean, I, I mentioned Telengard. I played I played hours and hours of Telengard. You know, it's 
one of the early roguelikes, you know, back when there still was, there wasn't roguelikes, there was Rogue <laughs> and Telengard and a couple of others. And a bunch of mainstream, or excuse me, mainframe RPGs that, uh, you know, I haven't seen. But, uh, you know, there was there was no story. I mean, there was, it was just, you know, here's your stats and you're moving them through a effectively a data structure of, you know, stuff and, you know, doing numbers and math and random dice rolls. And for some reason, you know, that grinding is, <laughs> can be really compelling. Um, yeah. You know, and that's, that's one thing is that whole leveling up. I don't know. There's, there's a little bit, there's, you know, kind of the gambling reflex there, you know, or, uh, you know, it's the, the whole risk and reward thing. You've got the whole leveling up and making progress thing. And, you know, especially with the games of the last, you know, decade or two, um, there's a storyline there that, you know, you know, I, I played a couple of games that really sucked, but I kept playing all the way to the end just because I wanted to see how the story ended up. And you combine all of these things together and it's, it's a pretty potent mix. And it's that, um, you know, and, and I think there were some other things that I don't know. I liked more in the old older games that you don't have quite so much anymore. Um, you know, I've talked about this uh, a few times. There was, you know, they required a bit more of a of an intellectual and emotional investment on the part of the player. Um, you know, especially when you had to, you know, not that I'm recommending this, you know, for any game, but you had to you know, break out the graph paper and write your own, you do your own maps, you know, as you went through, you know, like <clears throat> early wizardries or, <laughs> or so forth. Uh, that whole process of, uh, you know, putting everything that you saw on the screen onto the, onto the paper and, you know, the manual and all the little feelies that came with the, the, you know, the Ultima games, especially, um, it re you know required a bit of an investment of of yourself i feel uh into this this fictional game world and it was funny i mean it's the whole thing where you, you get out of it what you put into it and you know people complain that oh these games are too hard you know you need to actually read a manual in order to learn how to play and you know that's terrible you know they just want to jump in and and just play which you know there's there's a lot of virtue to that but um my uh my my feeling is, you know, when you had that that level of investment, that level of commitment, that we old school gamers really had to have. I mean, it was like doing a flight simulator. I mean, you know, you, you had to really, you had to master things almost before you, you know, rolled up your characters, or you, you know, wouldn't know what you were doing. Um, but I think that that helps create, uh, makes the whole game come more alive to you. If we, you know, if we can figure out a way of, that's not quite so, doesn't require quite as much, you know level of uh, masochism, I don't know, on the part of the players to, to get that level of investment and commitment uh, to the world, you know, to get people to invest a little bit more of themselves. Uh, you know, it's it's like playing the pay, pen and paper games. I mean, for a while you get to, the world becomes real and it becomes more compelling and you get to live an adventure. That's, you know, I, I love that. That's 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 what it is to me. No, not the not, these aren't their exact words, you know, but I've talked to a lot of designers, and they seem to have sort of, you know, especially, uh, well, never mind, I won't even mention any, any names, but <laughs> they seem to have this uh, sort of uh, idea that uh, back in the day, you know, not everybody had a computer. You, know, you had to have a certain in intellect even to be able to, to use this thing and to have one, so uh, sort of uh, naturally followed that the games would also be more intellectual, you know, more difficult. Uh, but as consoles took over now, you know, pretty much anybody who can, you know, put a cartridge in a slot <laughs> you know, is playing these things. So, I mean, do you uh, do you agree with that sort of this dumbing down trend? Oh, you know, I, I you know, it's, you really don't want to say dumbing down, but you know, yeah, basically. <laughs> well, we don't want to say retardation, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's it's funny because even with me, I mean, I, I I'm from that era, you know. I I got the my first computer was a ZX80. Sinclair ZX80, which was, you know, with one K of RAM. Yes, it was British machine. My dad got it at like a trade show for two hundred dollars. The little membrane keys, and and every time you press a button, the screen would blank out because it could either display the screen or read the keyboard. It couldn't do both at once. <laughs> and you know, there there really wasn't anything for it. It was like, here's your computer, do something with it, and you know, you're required to make your own entertainment. And of course, I tried to write these little adventure games because I, you know, 
Uh, in fact, I was in a podcast uh, with you <laughs> not too long ago where I talked about reading a friend's description of uh, the original Colossal Cave Adventure and the whole, you know, the whole thing was, oh, I thought that was great. And I found out how little text could fit inside of 1K of memory on a CX-80. I could get like two sentences out before I would run out of memory. But that was the thing, is I learned to program on that. And yeah, there was a lot of it. And you could write games. The other thing was, is the other thing that was happening at the time was uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, you know, it was a big, you know, you had to, it was all controversial and scary. It was demonic and making people kill themselves and stuff. And so, so of course, that, you know, people hear that, you know, you're, you're 15 years old. I want to play. <laughs> you know, it's, it's demonic and evil. And the, 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 the church ladies say, don't play it. You know, count me in. Where can I stop, sign up? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, there was a lot of uh, combination of that culture, the, 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 the computer guys and the, the D and D players, there was, you know, a lot of them were, were kind of the same thing. And, you know, a lot of us were writing our own little, you know, uh, D and D games or dice rollers or something like that. So we could actually play D and D when we couldn't get together with our friends. And, uh, you know, so, there, so I, I think it was right, but a lot of the games that came out at the time, I mean, especially you look at the, the first ones in a lot of these series, I mean, they were basically Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, you said, okay, you know, gee, all of these games have <clears throat> attributes that go from the range of 3 to 18. Why is that? <laughs> and a lot of that was to cater to that common culture, I think, that we had. And later, you know, as you know, they got to, you know, later versions of these games, the Ultimas and Might and Magics and stuff like that and Wizardry, they were able to kind of, you know, take off from that existing foundation and say, all right, we're going to assume that you've, you know, maybe you haven't played D&D, but you played our game before, so we can build off of that. But, uh, yeah, pretty much assumed a, a basic functional knowledge of Dungeons and & Dragons and what it takes to roll up a character. So uh, I think to that degree, um, you know, it wasn't really speaking to uh, a, a more intelligent or, uh, audience so much as an audience that was just very familiar with the subject matter. And uh, I think now, as we have the consoles and stuff like that, there's, they're not making those kinds of assumptions because, you know, you make those kind of assumptions, you you limit your market and you know today it's all about you know if if they don't think there's a potential to sell at least uh, uh it used to be like a million maybe it's two million now if there's not potential to sell at least a million of these don't even bother you know you're not even going to get accepted whereas you know i look at it as an indie and i'm like you need a, to sell a million just to make a profit <laughs> you know that's that's crazy um yeah, but uh anyway so th there there's that um so I don't know. There's there's two different ways of doing it, but I, I think there's part of it. Part of it is 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 dumbing down to to reach a wider audience, and and some of it is just you know they expected us to, to already know the rules or at least to understand. You know, when they when they refer to a a, a broadsword or something like that, you know, people know what a broadsword is. <laughs> Call it big sword, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's dumbing up. Yeah. Not dumbing. Okay, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about making money with games. I mean, I was just wondering if you were tempted to try to morph this into some sort of a Farmville, or as I like to call it, Scamville uh, type of, uh, what do they call these, social games. I mean, were you tempted to go with that sort of Zingo model? Uh, well, you know, when I started it, I think I don't think there was Facebook around when I started. So, <laughs> um, you know, I uh, going on to the future... Uh, I don't know. I I don't have that big of a thing for the Facebook style games, um, and so I, I tend to be of the same reason. I didn't go into casual games when they were in their heyday. Um, I mean, I experiment. I mean, I like a lot of casual games, but it didn't. You know, it wasn't the sort of thing that really gets my blood pumping. And uh, you know, now you've got uh, you're starting to get some really talented uh, designers out there. I mean, Brenda Brathwaite and John Romero and stuff like they're all doing Facebook games stuff like that now. And so we got some actual real game talent going into the Facebook field. So hopefully there'll be some awesome games coming out of there now. Uh, there's, there's a few uh, that are, are less... Are you playing any, any of those, by the way? Uh, you know, I've, I've played them. I've played a couple briefly. I played uh, Ravenwood Fair, which they, they worked on. It's actually. Romero's game, yeah. Yeah. Um, I played a little bit of that and, uh, you know, discovered that, you know, it's, 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 it's like the, 
it's like the mafia you know you get involved once and, and and you can never escape you're forever getting friends asking you for your help for whatever you know they'll try to drag you back in any which way they can and it's like i haven't played this game for a year guys <laughs> what's going on uh so I, you know I, I i played a few of them and you know if i if i could find the right game maybe i'd, I'd write something like that you know for I, I, if, it, if it excited me but you know again i'm doing this part-time i'm not making a whole lot of money doing it and so if it's not going to be any fun why bother <laughs> you know here's a sort of dark prediction for it i think it's just a matter of time for there's going to be some cult uh playing some game like that on facebook and they're all going to commit mass suicide you know and may, you know, it's, I, I see that you know coming it's sad, you know, but I mean, there's just something about that model that's really sinister to me. <laughs> but you have but anyway. <laughs> thought, dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving on, uh, I want to, you know, get back to uh, we'll touch on to, that uh, and nights. Uh, moving on. Yeah, don't play those games, folks. But okay, so you know, we were we, you were talking about how, uh, and you said this a couple times, how uh, Frayed Nights is sort of a meta D and D experience. You know, sort of like. Uh, you know, guys sitting, or guys and gals sitting around playing D and D. There's a lot of that uh, that's sort of infused into the game. You know, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, well, that's uh, you know, the old games. You know, like I, we were just talking about, um, the old games were very much, um, you know, us for D and D players. I mean, the original Ultimas, and I mean, his original games before uh, Akalabeth were like D and D one through D and D twenty seven or something. That was the name of it. Yeah, um, when he was doing them in high school. Um, Richard Garriott, uh, but uh, yeah, there 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 were four D and D players, and a lot of it was for you know the, these gamers because getting together a group of people, especially when you know not all of you drove, and you know you might need to you know get parents to drive you to each other's house, you know, when you're teenagers and stuff, or um, getting together in a group was kind of challenging, uh, you know, and uh, so that you know you. Now it's like if you can't find a group, you could play it on the computer. So a lot of these games really heavily borrowed from that role-playing, um, the dice and paper um, themes and uh, ideas, and have since then evolved on their own. Well, I, I hate using the word evolve. I think it's totally misused in the industry. Um, but uh, I think the, the mainstream games have, have kind of gone, you know, taken that, from those beginnings and kind of taken it and made a different genre about it. You know, it's uh, one I enjoy. I mean, I do, I do like those games um, too, but uh, you know, I, I played, I played lots of Diablo two and <laughs> everything. Um, and uh, you know, lots of oblivion and fallout three and everything. But um, you know, they, they, they kind of take it another direction and, and you hear them say things like, well, this is, this is this is how the industry was always going to go this way, you know, and you know, like you know, somehow they are fulfilling prophecy or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, it's okay, well, it's coming, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. For for me, I we we still every Saturday night we still get together. I I'm, I was very lucky. I married a girl who was both she was beautiful, smart, and a gamer. I'm one of the luckiest guys alive, so you know this is this is great stuff, and we still get together and we game every Saturday night. We play you know D and D or Pathfinder nowadays, or uh, some of the more esoteric ones, you know, Macho Women with Guns, or you know, somewhere we have our have our weird you know Thanksgiving. We do like we have one day of doing Thanksgiving, and the rest of the weekend we just we play RPGs, one shots, and have a great time. And so there's a lot of inspiration, and from from those. Um, and uh, one of the things I, I thought when I was working on this is, okay, you know, while a, a large part of the industry has kind of gone a particular way with the RPG, what about taking it back to its, its roots in some ways? Because um, the pen and paper gaming has evolved quite a bit since, you know, 1979 when, you know, the, the origin of at least consumer level personal computer RPGs came about. Um, you know, what about taking some of that and taking some of that gamer culture and, and everything? So, and pulling that into into these games and, and kind of getting back to its roots a little bit. So, you know, why I say, you know, my uh, inspirations were, you know, games like, uh, you know, the Wizardry series and so forth. But uh, just as much, it's from, 
you know, my own gaming group that I get together with on Saturday nights and some of the, you know, weird, goofy stuff that we, you know, we do and say and, and, and trying to, to bring that experience back to the player. Um, one of the, the conceits I had when I was working on the game was, uh, you know, kind of my vision was, you know, what if, you know, I was, I was also borrowing a little bit from, from MMOs, you know, uh, EverQuest in City of Heroes I played a lot of, but, you know, World of Warcraft, duh, and, you know, everything else. But um, I said, you know, what if, what if you had this, this world that is designed like um, a very exuberant 14-year-old dungeon master, which, you know, I was channeling my, my inner 14-year-old, you know, exuberant, but stupid 14 year old for this, which made it really easy. And uh, I said, so there's this world. It's, it's very, so where's earnest. all the naked women? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that was, that's, that's the secret Easter egg level. Remember, right? You know, <laughs> had him in Warhawk and you know, no, I, I don't. It's uh, uh, <clears throat> mothers. Uh, it's the game is safe for <laughs> your, your, your teenage sons, at least. <laughs> um, Hot coffee mod. <laughs> I probably sell a lot more games that way, but uh, <laughs> anyway. But uh, so, I, so I did that, and I said, okay, and let's have these characters that are in the game as if they were veteran D and D players, kind of behind them. You know, they stay in character almost all the time, but they've got this this whole you know this this whole world is peopled like in an MMO with veteran adventurers who you know, and and so they you know what what do they do what do you take when you take these fantasy tropes um especially the, the fantasy rpg D D tropes and play with them a little bit and, and and what happens when you know you get adventurers that come into a town and immediately think of the npcs as being nothing but npcs you know they're not people they're just you know people you talk to for quests and and uh it, it, stuff like that and you know they've got their own terminology their own their own language that they use that you know to describe common events with their little culture and anyway and, and that was part of the with the world development and i had a lot of fun with that and hope to have plenty of more fun with it as i continue the series and uh so that was uh and so that was that was kind of where i where i wanted to take that and, and i i drew a lot from you know pen and paper and and mmos to to try and capture some of that i thought about about this a lot when i was writing that Dungeons and Desktops about how it's relatively easy to program in the stats and the dice rolling and all this kind of stuff, but it's really difficult, you know, to try to bring in that social element that's so important in D&D. Uh, &D. So I think actually your drama points and uh, drama star system, you know, seems relevant here somehow. And I, I mean, to me, that's a very uh, original uh, contribution. I really like that uh, system. So I'm just wondering, uh, you know, I, I don't know of a precedent. You said earlier that you... Uh, <laughs> there are some precedents for this. And I just kind of interesting how did this uh, idea uh, come about? And... Um, it was a combination of a couple of things. Um, the one is, you know, when I said taking things from from pen and paper, there that you have gotten with some uh, some of the newer game systems, you have some uh, you know like action points or something like that that players can use to. Um, basically to contradict the game master, you know, so it's, you know, you say, oh, you know, suddenly this terrible thing happens to you. Oh, no, I'm going to spend my action points and I should be okay. And it gives players a little bit of the control over the, the storytelling. And so that was, that was part of it and kind of part of what I drew from, uh, although the drama points in, in Prey Nights work very differently. But um, the other thing was uh, just from, well, just from my own personal experience, I mean, you, when you play um, a, a live, you know, our tabletop dice and paper RPG, um, you know, you, you don't have the ability to restore a saved game. Uh, you know, when, when the DM says you're dead, it's time to look for a resurrection um, if that game supports it. Otherwise, it's time to roll up a new character. Uh, and so there's a lot of, and, you know, MMOs kind of have that too. There's a lot, uh, a lot more you know, seriousness with, okay, you know, with your decisions and, and all that. The one approach to try and capture that, or rather two approaches, uh, I, I wasn't too fond of. I mean, the one is in, in some roguelikes, you've got permadeath, um, which is fun to play occasionally, but, you know, I, 
that's not the kind of game I wanted to make with this. You know, I, I enjoy it in small doses, but Frayed Nights, you know, it just didn't seem right with the comedic, you know, style of game and suddenly the, okay, you're dead, you know. <laughs> you know, this, this character's permanently removed from the party. Well, what do I do with all the dialogue I'd written? You know, that's, <laughs> that gets, makes it very difficult. <laughs> yeah, permadeath. Yes, go ahead. Anyway, uh, another approach that they do is one that I personally despise, which is the very limited save games, you know, where it's like, oh, you know, you can save over here, and then you have to go through a half an hour of mandatory gameplay till you get over here and you can allow it to save again. Unless you're fighting a boss, in which case it's an hour and a half if you're playing a JRPG. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, you know as, a, as, a, as a guy with a family and a job and a real life, I, mean, I, I, have, I have rage quit games because of that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's ridiculous. I, you know, and so I, I hate the idea of, you know, very limited saves. I mean, sure, there's times like in combat, you know, Afraid Nights 2, where, okay, you can't save in the middle of this combat, but I want to be able to save anywhere, and that's, that's very important to me. Well, what you get with that in, you know, the older games, there's been different approaches, some other weird approaches where you had to, you know, cost you money to, you know, gold to restore your game or something like that. I'm trying to remember which one was it, Arcania? That had that anyway, um, but uh, I so all these little ideas gelled, and I said, okay, what I really want is a game where you could save anywhere, you know, same as anything else. And if you want to save scum or you know whatever to, you know, keep, you know, you get into a fight, and I do this all, you know, the Baldur's Gate Infinity Engine games too. I do this all the time, but uh, you know, especially if you could save during combat, where it's like, oh, this combat didn't work out the way I wanted. I'm just going to revert, you know, because <laughs> I don't want to spend the money to resurrect this guy and lose the XP or. Or oh gee, we you know we used too many spells. I blew a fireball and it didn't hit anyone, and so you know I want to conserve that. And, you know, and so you, you do this, and you know it occurred to me that making a story, you know, if you're trying to tell a story from this game, the story is really boring because your characters always made the right decisions and always came out on top on every combat. You know, if you're going, I'm like that's not very dramatic. That's not very fun storytelling. And so I you know what I thought was, well, what if we gave you a reason to encourage you, not force you, but encourage you to stick with it, you know, to stick with the bad decisions, to stick with the less than optimal thing, you know, where you might have lost a character, and, and then you actually are going to have to fight your way to get back home and get them, you know, brought back, restored, and and that's really where that came from, and I, I, I said, you know, let's, let's do this, uh, do this approach so that there's actually some drama and excitement and encourages the, the players to feel that, you know, like in a, like in a, a dice and paper game where, you know, you, have, you live with your consequences. And, you know, if disaster strikes, okay, pff, fine, you, you reload a previous save game. And uh, so I had this idea that, you know, whenever something dramatic happens, you get a point, and when you get enough of these points, you can then spend them on extra things outside of the game that didn't, that weren't really character abilities, that were something that the player has an influence to. Like, bring a character back to life or, you know, back to, you know, non-incapacitated state. Um, and, uh, or, you know, restore their health or endurance or just something, you know, basically cheat the game a little bit. And so, anyway, and the thing that makes it work is that these, you know, points don't get saved with your save game. So, you know, you've always got the choice. And the idea was, well, you know, there's two different ways you can play it, you know, if you, you know, try and you know, if you're if you're approaching a trap, you know, this is the other part where the save game stuff sucks, is that you've got a trap or something. It's like, well, you know, okay, you keep restoring the game until you successfully disarm the trap. You know, there's no there, the randomness or something is, is meaningless and, and they tend to now dumb that down and get rid of that in a lot of the modern games. Um, I said, Okay, well now, now it has meaning because if you if you quit and restore it, you're you know, you can do that, you just lose the drama points. Um, you know, may, whether that's the right choice or not. So it really gives you more options instead of fewer, and I thought it was a pretty good thing. And and based on reviews and what the players are saying, it looks like, you know, there's one thing I did right in the game, and that's it. <laughs> so, hey, go me. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll be back next week with part three of my interview with Jay Barnson, the rampant coyote. Got a lot of great stuff to cover, so stay tuned for that. I know you're going to enjoy it. And as always, I want to thank you if you've been uh, donating to the show. That makes a big difference. Uh, but don't forget, you can also, as long as you use my affiliate link, uh, buy a uh, support match at by buying games from GOG. And I really think you should uh, be 
buying games from GOG anyway. Uh, these are great guys. Uh, they provide a lot of classic games. They uh, pre-configure them to run on modern operating systems so you don't have to mess around with uh, DOS box or anything like that. And they include the manuals and sometimes goodies like soundtracks. And the best part of it is it's uh, absolutely DRM free uh, so you know these games will uh, be around uh, five, ten years later when you want to play them again. I think GOG's doing a, a really uh, important uh, work uh, for people like me and people like you who are interested in classic games. Uh, just don't forget if you want to uh, buy games from them, uh, use my affiliate links in the show notes or channel page and then I'll get a small percentage. Uh, but it does add up and I really appreciate it, so uh, go check them out if you haven't already. And as always, I want to leave you with a quotation. Uh, and it goes, I'll, I'll tell you who it is afterward. I, I find it kind of surprising. Uh, but anyway, here's the quotation. A great writer possesses not only his own spirit, but the spirit of his friends. Said by Friedrich Nietzsche. <laughs> See you guys next week.